All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and thanks for hanging out with us. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming into this first uh, session for Canvas uh, through NCDPI, uh, focusing on uh, tonight is course accessibility. Uh, so my name is Corey McNeil, and I am the product manager for Canvas and Go Up at NC uh, for DPI. Uh, I've recently moved in this position, so I was uh, at a LEA before this. I was in Roman Salisbury Schools, and so just recently stepped into this role. Uh, with me tonight is Sarah Matthews, and she is, um, I always forget your title, so I'm just going to let you introduce yourself because I, I can never remember. Um, Take away. Oh, okay. So uh, my name is Sarah Matthews. I am a principal learning consultant because it's a big old mouthful there. Um, I uh, did most of my teaching actually in CMS in Charlotte and North Carolina, and I live just over the border in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Um, and I'm excited to be here. Well, thank you guys yeah. for hanging out with us. And so I am going to share a few things with you to get started. Um, and uh, actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back to those. So I'm just gonna go ahead and let Sarah take it over, and we're gonna talk about uh, course accessibility and let her get on with her time because I know you have a hard stop. I do have a hard stop. I'm gonna screen too. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. My presentation. Okay. So I um this might make some of y'all uncomfortable, but I am gonna be. You can see across the top. I have some tabs open. I'm going to be hopping in and out of my presentation. So I'm actually not going to go into um, present mode, which which uh, might drive some of y'all crazy, but uh, it's just easier for me to flip around if I'm if I'm not not in present mode. So tonight we're going to talk about um, course accessibility or ensuring accessibility through Canvas course design. So we have a pretty um, it looks sparse, but it's robust um, agenda tonight. We're going to talk about um, considerations, um, accessibility, like what do we offer already built into canvas right so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and then best practices tips and tricks that sort of thing all right so um and corey's going to chime in because we uh, present well together so um if i forget things or if i'm like corey talk to me about ncdpi's perspective on this he's just gonna he's gonna enlighten us so um why why does it matter um well i mean there's a, there's the you know the legal requirement part of that answer, right? Um, I don't like to lead with that, but I feel like um, I would not be, I'd be doing y'all a disservice if I didn't mention that. But it's also part of good course design, right? Like it's just considered best practice in course design. And so um, when we when we start talking about accessibility, right, we're gonna get into considerations. We'll, we'll kind of answer that question about what do we mean um, by accessibility? Does NCDPI have a, a, a stance or a one liner or something along those lines around accessibility. Oh, that's something I probably would know it if I have been the DPI longer. It's than true. Maybe four it's been weeks. Like, yeah, um, a few weeks. So um I I would say, I mean, as educators, we obviously want to do everything we can to make learning accessible to a child. Um and obviously sort of, and that's in compliance with anything that might be related to uh EC. So but that'd be a IEP 504 kind of situation. So that we all know that that learning, um, you know, it's certainly when we think about testing and accountability, there's a lots of things that frame around that. So we want to make sure that this the learning environment, just as the physical classroom would be accessible to all our students, the same will be the case in the online learning environment. So in this case, Canvas. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We want to make sure and, and, you know, nobody likes to, like you said, Sarah, drink out the like, well, you have to do it because it's legal, but, you know, like. We all, I mean, and you, you all would, I think, would agree that we want to do what's best for our students. And I like the the language that we're operating in the the widest possible range of situations. It makes me think of like the least restrictive environment, right? Like the same kind of idea that we're going to give kids what they need in in the the least restrictive environment we can provide for them. So, um, some considerations. Um, if we're looking, so that these are a big, um, the uh, web content accessibility guidelines um, is, kind of, is where I pulled from here to talk about um, considerations. So when we're looking at it at a glance, these are the the, um, the topics, I guess you could say that, or the, the things that we would hold accessibility up to, right? Is, is it um, perceivable? So text alternatives, um, captions is a big one like we're doing now, right? Um, you guys were generating captions as we're meeting. Um, presentation methods, we're gonna, we're gonna talk more about these things. I'm just kind of giving you the big broad overview. 
um, operable. So that would just be the nav, the navig, navigability. I can't even say it. The, being able to navigate right through the online um, uh, virtual classroom, the online space, um, it, all the way down to um, the keyboard functionality, right? Um, and time. And we're going to talk about how those things play play a role in accessibility. Um, understandable. So um, logical flow. This is one that I think we all naturally um, gravitate towards um, when we're looking at our online online classrooms. But logical flow, font size and color, clear directions. We all um, are are somewhat right course designers, and so those things tend to stick out to us if something's kind of off there. Um, and then robust, so compatibility with user tools. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some user tools, not a lot, um, because I work for Canvas, but I've got a few that I need to mention just because I think they work work really well in ensuring accessibility. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot uh, in the Q and A is about is around colors, and so I have um, questions around, um, you know, my accessibility checker in Canvas is flagging. XYZ color, um, why, why is that an, an issue, right? So um, some of it has to do with um, screen readers, right? So if you have the yellow text, um, it's difficult for the screen reader to kind of pick up that, that um, particular color. Or if you have a visually impaired student, right? Or all, we've got um, color blindness, you have all kinds of things that we need to kind of be aware of. So um, contrast. So if you have a uh, too light, of a color of a font on too dark of a background. Y'all have all been to websites where contrast has been an issue. I, I know I have. Um, it, that, that's what that is, right? That you're, the, the contrast between the background and the font color is not enough and your eyes sometimes have trouble um, kind of distinguishing the, the text there. So color matters is my point. And so a couple of tools to help with um, ensuring accessibility through colors. And my favorite is Colorzilla and I actually have um, I'm going to move Corey. I actually have Colorzilla installed in my um, uh, Chrome here. And so what I can do is I can go in, it's an extension, and click on Colorzilla and I can pick colors from any page. So it turns into like a little droplet, right? And I can actually, I'm not going to like it because I'm doing a presentation, but um, I can actually hover over and eventually it'll catch up here. And I can pull colors and it gives me the, um, the hex code, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. Um, if I want to um, pick colors uh, from pages. And then I can also um, upload an image and pull uh, hex codes from those images as well. So a couple of different ways to help you um, pull hex codes for colors. A hex code is essentially like um, the number letter uh, code that you would put in on the HTML side if you're working in Canvas and you want to flip over to HTML. Um, you, you can put it in there. If you're using Canva or like another instructional um, design or graphic element, um, hex codes are the things you can put in specifically to pick or pull a color um, to use there. So um, it's usually like five digits long. Six maybe? digits. Six. Okay, I was trying to remember off the top of my head, six digits long. Yeah. Um, and it's usually like a combination of numbers and letters. You got anything to say about color? Oh, I have lots of things to say about okay. color, but you know. See, most people um, don't want to talk about color, so. Oh, I you know, but I, you know, I love HTML and stuff like that. So yeah. that's, that's, that's where I, I love to hang out. So yes. Um, and if you use Mac, um, if you have a, a Mac computer, there's actually um, there's a color picker tool that's natively installed on your uh, computer that you can use that I utilize a lot, but yes, so. Um, that's a cool, I didn't know about that Chrome extension. So that's pretty neat. Yeah, I like Colorzilla. I use the Mac one, but we we all use the Colorzilla together, so. Um, okay, so let's talk about Canvas real quick because um, that's really what you wanna know, right? Is like, so we have to do this thing because um, you're telling me it's legal, it's, it's a legal issue and you're telling me that, um, that it's best practice, right? So like, what are some things that we have built into Canvas to help you accomplish your, your mission to make your online virtual learning space accessible? Um, so the first thing I wanted to point out is that we've got some tools for you um, that are available to you. And I, I embedded these, these are links here and Corey's gonna um, share the presentation with you. 
um, at, in the end. Um, so uh, you guys will have access to these. If you haven't seen the course evaluation checklist, it's going to pop up and it's going to force you to make a copy. Um, if you've never seen it before, it's probably my favorite tool um, and it's free. Um, you can, I mean, if you go in and show your friends this course valuation checklist, you're going to be like a hero. Um, so, so essentially what, what, when we're talking about accessibility, right, the things we need to look at, there are, there are, um, criteria organized around, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for here? what you would say, like basically organized around different components of building um, courses in Canvas and organizing content, that sort of thing. So for example, the first one is course information. All of the different components have criteria that are um, ranked by one star essential, two star best practice, or three star exemplary. The things that we're worried about in terms of accessibility live right here in this essential. Right? These are considered essential or foundational right, um, things to um, building uh, your virtual learning space in Canvas. So we actually went in um, and got more granular because originally we just had essential and we actually went in and, and changed this um, to have that foundational as well. So um, if, if, you're, if you're trying to ask yourself, right, like what are some things that I can do or look at to make sure I have um, my course accessible, I would turn to this checklist and I would look at all of these one star criteria, right, organized around these components. So this one's course information, course content is, is where the majority of the um, accessibility um, components live, um, assessment, and then there's this guy, course accessibility. Um, this is going to have um, it, it is a, a wealth of information for you here. So you, um, if I were to say to you, uh, make sure that um, your web tools or software are utilized to identify and correct access accessibility issues. And you were, were to look at me like, I have no idea what that means, Sarah, right? Like you can come over here to this link here to the handy guides. And if you haven't been to the Canvas guides, you're missing out. Um, click on this and it'll take you right there to the guide that explains what that is and then how to do it, right? So same thing if we wanted to learn more about color right there's um, a canvas guide here that's going to explain more about color why it's important and how we can make sure that we are um, uh, making sure that our online space is accessible in that way right so there's a whole um, component here around course accessibility and all of them except for tables and i'm going to briefly mention tables in just a minute um, are considered one star, like essential, right? Essential things for us to consider around course accessibility. Um, tables are um, the bane of my existence. Um, they, in, in Canvas, I'm a table person. I love tables, charts. I was a history teacher, so I used to make charts for fun, still do. Um, in Canvas, they create um, problems. They wreak havoc because um, of the one, because of, of course, of the design nature aspect of them, um, but two, right, we've got to worry about accessibility. And when we have screen readers, we have to make sure that our screen readers um, are reading tables as we would read a table and not just reading all the words in order, right? I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that. Um, so tables are, are a little tricky. And if you're going to use tables, right, I would definitely make sure that you come in here and um, creating accessible tables and read that um, particular um, article because I think I think it would be kind of eye opening. At one point, I think there was a thing in there where it showed you like what it looked like or sounded like if you didn't make them accessible, and it's it is it is eye opening. Um, I'm not going to get into tables tonight because they're like accessibility 2.0. Um, my my advice always in like a um, an intro to accessibility is to avoid tables for the moment. But if you are using them and you love them like I do, and you want to go in and make sure they're accessible, you can come in here and, and grab that and look at it. Yep. And I would say a lot of teachers use a table to format a homepage in a way that's aesthetically pleasing, um, mm -hmm. but not necessarily might be um, accessible to all their students. So um, definitely something to consider there. Accurate. I see it a lot in homepages too. So take a look at my my favorite tool, Merry Christmas to you. Um, it is free and available to use. Um, share it with anyone you'd like. 
uh, it's not, um, it'll force copy, right? So you can just share the link and it will force copy for everybody that has it. I hope you enjoy it. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is the mobile design checklist. And um, I like bringing this up because a lot of people say, um, well, my students have Chromebooks or my students have um, laptops and they're not using, they're not accessing Canvas um, from a mobile device. But the research is showing that it's not true, right? That um, maybe they do have a Chromebook, but they're still um, checking um, Canvas for grade updates or looking at quick assignments or discussion posts or, you know, engaging in their online learning space from a mobile device. Um, our, our research is showing like 80% of the time. That's a lot. Um, so I think that even if we don't maybe believe or think that we need to um, design for mobile considerations, it's definitely um, more prevalent than maybe than maybe we thought or would like to, to think. Um, so we came out with this course evaluation check checklist mobile app design considerations um, because of that. So if you want to read more about that, you can go in and read. There's a um, community uh, blog post there that does a really good job kind of setting the context there. You can also leave comments if you want. Um, so again, it's it's laid out in the very same way. We're just looking at mobile design. So mobile design here, we've got the essential. Um, and then we've got the course enhancement here as the two. It's not nearly as robust as the, the other one. Um, but I definitely think it's worth your time. It's going to do the same thing when you click on the link. It's going to ask you to force copy. Um, and then you can go in and if you have questions about what things are, you can click there, right? It also gives you examples, um, which I really like because I'm incredibly visual. <laughs> um, so it's going to talk to you about why those things are important with examples. So again, share and share alike with all of your friends. Um, and, and I would also echo that even though your students might be accessing it on uh, a laptop uh, or a Chromebook, you, there's also the Canvas Parent app, which mm -hmm. um, your you know your families may be leveraging to look at uh, courses and resources. And so you want to make sure that they're having a good uh, experience and can navigate that successfully as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a parent Canvas app for my child and I only look at it on my phone. So I don't, I, I never log on to my computer and look at it. So. Um, okay, so two things I wanted to share with you kind of that I thought would be helpful um, tools for you. So they're embedded there if, if you would like. Um, the other thing we did was we built in, um, in our RCE, in the Rich Content Editor, we built in an accessibility checker and it's um, this little guy right here. So, um, I am going to, I don't think I did, I did. Um, I have the guide pulled up, so if we wanted to take a look at some examples, we could, but um, it's a tool that's in your RCE that actually now, um, I think, I can't remember if it has to be enabled or if it's automatic, but now will automatically, as you're building out content in Canvas, will um, populate with, with little numbers. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen this, right? Um, down at the bottom and you're like, what is that thing, right? That's your accessibility checker that's working while you're building. Um, clearly we have some issues here because there's a table. Um, so <laughs> tables are gonna, gonna do that every time. So anyway, so that's built in, it's an, in your RCE at the bottom. And what it's looking for, right? Or this is, uh, I don't think this is an exhaustive list, but these are kind of the, the heavy hitters here. Um, text contrast, um, table captions, are you captioning out your table for your screen readers? Um, uh, alt image, so uh, image alt text, so telling, uh, uh, tagging an image that you put in um, Canvas as decorative or telling uh, it what uh, de a description of that image, right? Um, paragraph heading, um, adjacent links is a huge, a huge one that it looks for, right? So it's looking for um, lots of things, right? And if we go into the guide, right, there's an even, even more exhaustive list. So if you're building in the RCE, um, you can um, go in, it's going to automatically um, check for you. I, I always point this out, guys, as you go through it, what it's going to do is it's going to have like a little um, slide out, right, to the side. And uh, if you don't have any, or if you correct all of your issues, you get a celebration, which um, the balloons, kind of like confetti, right, that we released a few years ago. 
um, it's going to walk you through issue by issue. So it's going to go one at a time um, and it's going to tell you one at a time all of the, the different accessibility issues that have been identified and you can fix those right there um, and then come back, right? And it's going to slide out and tell you that you, you don't have any more issues. Um, so that I think that's that built-in accessibility checker um, has been something that I mean, I use it every day um, because it, it's automatically kind of checking for me. Um, and then guides here, right? So this would be, it's showing here that we had four issues, right? So it's gonna walk us through and then it's gonna tell us what we need to do to fix that issue. And you apply your fix and you're good to go. I did just go so, and look and check. Um, this feature actually just rolled out um, to be turned on October the 16th. So um, previously your Canvas admin in your district could have turned that on for your district, but it's recently just been turned on for all Canvas accounts. So um, that should be on in your in your school system. Um, also, I think, you know, a lot of people may say, I well, I design courses or only work in Canvas for PD stuff for our staff. Um, the, you know, it's also just good practice to model that if you're working with teachers, just to make sure that your content is accessible, just as we would want teachers to make their content accessible for their students. Um, so I, I think it's really cool. I, I like that it pops it right up there and shows me those reminders because I don't always remember to add alt text to my images because I think, well, it's just a picture. Um, but, you know, that's because I have the, you know, the fortunate and grace that I can see the picture <laughs> and know what it is and don't need to rely on that alt text. So what would happen is if I if I didn't give this alt text right this this is going to read as um, you know I I M G underscore you know one six five zero right like and that's what's going to read as um, as opposed to you know Washington the Constitutional Convention right like it's it's the descriptor right of the actual image instead of the file name if that makes sense whatever it was that we pulled over um, yeah. That's a, those are usually what, what I encounter when I'm looking at accessibility issues, and that's an easy fix. You just put a little description um, right there of what it is. Um, link validator is another one, right? So um, link validator is built in um, as a tool in um, settings. So it's going to let you know if your links that are all over your Canvas course are invalid or unreachable. Um, it, it doesn't automatically fix it for you. So I felt the need to point that out because I've had that question before, but it will let you know that the link is broken or, or invalid. So if you come over here into your course settings right here, so this is your global nav, this is your course settings, right? You can come over here to validate links and content, right? And it's going to start it. And then it's gonna tell you um, what's going on all throughout your course, not just on that page or in that particular module or in that area of your course. Um, I run Link Validator, if I'm teaching a semester course, I run it a couple of times um, if I'm linking to external links. And just as a, as a best practice, I try not to, I try to make everything Canvas native for my mobile um, users, but occasionally, sometimes I have an external um, link. And so I run it a couple of times just to make sure that my, um, none of my links are broken or um i didn't link to something in canvas and then change that page title or something you know what i mean something along those lines mm -hmm. months later when i'm editing the course that ha that's happened to me a few times too um so link validator it's built in super easy to get to it's in your course nav in your settings validate links and content everything any tips about link validator Pretty uh, no, it just I, as someone who <laughs> teaches a university class, I really use this frequently to make sure I haven't linked to an article or something that I want my students to read that has, you know, been discontinued on that publishing site or something like that. It's it's yeah. very helpful. Yeah. Um, immersive reader. So I don't know how much experience you guys have with immersive reader. So I was at the secondary level and um, it wasn't something. Um, the idea even of like an immersive reader wasn't necessarily something that we intuitively um, kind of reached for, but it, it's phenomenal um, and it is free. It's a free tool. Um, it uh, has to be turned on at the account level. So um, I added that 
um, in there because I felt like that was, if some of you don't have immersive reader, you can see it right here um, on the tops of your pages, it looks like that. Um, if you don't have immersive reader or don't have access to it or can't figure out why, um, it might be something that you need to, to you know, run up the chain to get someone at the account level to help you um, talk about turning that on. Um, it, it is something that uh, at one point, well, it has, has been free, but it has been determined that it's going to continue to be free. And so I don't know if maybe some people never jumped on the bandwagon because they thought it was going to be an add-on or that kind of thing, but um, it's a free tool. It's something that we should use. So um, I like this one because it kind of it kind of shows you the things that it can do. So it can change the font size, text spacing, and background color. Um, background color is helpful for me, <laughs> me sometimes, right? Like um, I appreciate that split words into syllables, um, which I think even if um, if you're if you're a struggling reader or new to reading, right? That's something that that's pretty helpful. Um, highlighting verbs, nouns, adjectives, read te um, out text out loud. Uh, I phrased that poorly. Um, and change the speed of reading. Um, and then it also offers a picture dictionary here, um, which I think is awesome, not just for um, struggling readers, but even EL students, right? Or students who, who might be visual, visual learners, that sort of thing. Um, our littles who are maybe respond to the, the picture dictionary while they're learning to read. So uh, I cannot say enough good things about Immersive Reader. Have you used, have, did you guys use Immersive Reader in your? Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. Uh, I really liked it, especially for uh, uh, use case for we're working with the EC population mm -hmm. um, and my district. So we, we did some some conversations around that. But I think it's a, it's a great tool. Um, but, and I don't know if you're going to talk about this, but there are some limitations with yeah. where it is uh, available to be used. It's getting uh, better in terms of being more broadly available um, consistently throughout a course. So yes, there are definitely some limitations. Um, I wasn't going to go into a ton of detail around the limitations, um, mainly because it's an account level um, tool, but uh, I can definitely, I think I didn't, I can link out the uh, the guide there, which will kind of go into those details. It's yeah. not a, it's not something that you can turn on and then we'll read the, we'll guide the student through the entire, entire course, right? It's available in pockets. Agreed. Um, okay, I was gonna talk about that, but I knew we were gonna be running low on time. So I wanna talk to you guys about some best practices. Um, these are things that, um, are, are, are framed around um, accessibility, right? But they're kind of a bit bigger and broader. Um, sorry, Corey, I have to mute you again. Okay. Um, so, so some of these things I wanted, I wanted to talk to you guys about that are, um, that are helpful for accessibility, but they're just in general, right? Accessibility is a best practice, right? So these are just the best practices I thought, thought we should look at. Um, utilizing modules effectively. Um, modules are the backbone of um, a canvas course and i know we get super excited about our home pages like super excited and i totally understand um it, it is i um i always describe it as like when you're a new a, a teacher and you come in and you decorate your classroom right and you get really excited and you pick out all the things and you do themes and you do right like that's me and making a home page seriously um in my online space that that's the the brick and mortar equivalent um, awesome, super helpful for navigation, all those things, but modules are the backbone of Canvas, right? That's where students interact with and engage with our content. So it's really important that we think through how we're going to use them, um, come up with a module structure and then duplicate that module structure and use it over and over and over, right? Um, that doesn't mean that we can't try new things, right? We can't say, um, I'm going to organize my content in, in two weeks. Right, and we're going to go with that for a while, um, and then maybe we get some feedback from our students that that isn't working. Right, um, then maybe we need to try organizing our content in our modules by um, content, right, or or topic or unit of study. Right, so there's lots of ways that we can kind of organize our modules, but the point is is that we think through it and we try it and we we find a system that works and then we're consistent. Um, so I cannot cannot stress to you how important modules are and kind of thinking through that. Um, navigation it goes back to in the very beginning we talked about um, navigation being a part of accessibility how you structure the back end or how you 
um, organize your modules definitely, definitely feeds into that. Um, I don't, I always put in any kind of presentation, make sure you publish your module because I still do that sometimes where I'll forget to, I mean, it, it, it's quite funny actually. They're like, oh, you did that on purpose. I'm like, no, no, it's just that easy, right? To overlook that. But um, so make sure you publish your module, but at the same time, kind of keep in mind that um, you can rearrange your modules. They're flexible in structure. Um, I like that if I, organize my content and um, I don't quite get to something I can pull it down into another module really easily or rearrange my days. Um, I like the flexibility um, of the module. I, I think it helps uh, me respond to student learning, right, in a, in, a, um, in a timely way, right? We need more time with this? Great. I'm going to pull this stuff down into another module. Um, you need to do, we're, we're ready to move on. Great. I'm going to pull some stuff up from a module, right? I can do those things because they're, they're flexible like that. And if you've never looked at, um, prerequisites, um, or if you, if you want to like lock, right, your modules or kind of control the flow of your course, um, take a look at that. Um, I, I, I didn't necessarily use them in the beginning, but I found them to be my friend, um, after a while. So. What do you think about modules? I, I can talk about modules all day long. I was going to say, I could tell what's on the next slide. So I was going to wait and, and add my comment here. I love the text headers probably just as much as you love the modules because it allows me to organize things because this is how my brain thinks and works. And I think makes it very clear and succinct to see where we are, what's the plan, where we're going and the ability to indent them. Um, in all of the ways makes it nice, a nice flow for me. And I think makes it easy and transparent for students to see as well. Yeah. And the icons. So we've got the different icons and I know you guys are well aware of this, right? But like those help just look at the 10,000 foot view of a module. I can glance through it and say, okay, I'm going to do all these things. Oh, and I'm going to have a quiz at the end of the week. And I can tell right away before we even talk, right? About the things that we're going to do in class together. Um, this is an example of a module template. Um, a good one, and I'll tell you why, because it's got a quiz in it, um, and you can't duplicate a module that has a quiz in it. But the idea is, right, that you find a structure, maybe it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right, something along those lines, and then you duplicate that week after week so that you don't have to keep um, reinventing the wheel. Um, but I will say you cannot duplicate a module with a quiz in it. So you would have to take that quiz out, duplicate it, right, and put your quiz in. Um, I linked in here, um, I'm out about modules. Um, I think this is published in the guides, right? It's a blog post, um, talking a little bit more about modules. It, it takes it, uh, breaks down that, uh, the module as, um, a binder, right? Kind of analogy. If you want to think about it that way. Um, that's usually how I describe it. Cause back in the day when I was a teacher, I had a binder for each of my units. And so now I have modules for each of my units, right? Instead, um, this links out though. So if you um were to click on it right it's going to take you to that community post and take you to a lot more information about modules than you knew existed um but it's here um and i cannot cannot stress how important modules are um real quick a little bit about pages um so a module is how we organize pages or content or quizzes or discussions right we put pages into into modules um and then we have a home page right um, so it is where we um, put our content out there, right, for our students to engage with. Um, you can, anywhere you have the RCE, which is uh, pages, announcements, discussions. Um, what am I thinking? I'm missing. Um, I mean, assignments. assignments. Uh, uh, is there RCE in the top of the quizzes? Yeah, you can put put that in there. Anywhere you have the RCE, right? Mm -hmm. You can put um, links, images, video, um, all the things, right? Um, not just pages. So anywhere you can access the RCE, but um, it's 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 an incredibly valuable tool because you can use it to um, organize your content in multiple ways, right? I love, for example, that I can link out to different parts of Canvas that essentially. Um, if, I, if I'm typing out my content about um, something, you know, in one 
a unit of study and I want to harken back to another unit of study or go forward, right? I can link it right there and my students don't have to go rifling through their, their binders to try to find this thing that I'm referencing. They can just click on it and it's right there. Um, I use uh, uh, course links all the time in Canvas. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can also use, we also suggest using visual cues or icons, right? Here's an example of that. Um, coming up with a, a visual cue or icon set or system so that students kind of know right off the bat when they see it. Kind of like when I looked at this, if I were to say, oh, I've got a quiz on Thursday, like I would just kind of glance down and see it, right? That visual cue or icon would help me. So kind of coming up with, with a set that you use over and over um, throughout your course. A little bit more on pages. Um, hold on. Here we go. Um, make sure that you, um, if you're going to use images, which I highly suggest that you do, that you have your alt text in there. Um, link out to resources. If you're going to use videos or screencasts, make sure you have the um, closed captioning and/or transcript. Um, adding visual breaks, which we made uh, so much easier. You don't have to go in and use Corey the HTML anymore, right? You can just go into the RCE and add a line, right? Um, if you know some HTML tips and tricks, you can make the line thicker and change the color and do all those fun things. But um, we have made it a lot easier to kind of insert a line and, and chunk or um, break up that, that information as well. Um, so that's pages. So just so modules are where you organize all of your things, right, including pages. Um, and a page is kind of one singular piece of a module. Let's see. Discussions. So um, I'm almost done. So discussions are um, uh, just some quick best 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 practices around discussions. Um, make sure that you what what is the purpose of them? Right to create a space where students can share their work and ask questions. I've seen discussions used in some really cool ways. Um, discussion boards pinned right so that students um, can post questions there throughout the year. Right, not just um, uh, used for an engagement tool around a particular idea. Um, I, I thought that was really interesting, uh, but make sure you, if you're going to use it, right, that you provide clear directions for students. Um, I always say that you can't be too specific, um, right, that you are really clear with your students. So this one that I, I um, grabbed a screen grab of, right, has multiple steps and then gives a tip. Um, if I am going to, um, the same way I would with assignments, right, like if I'm going to limit the way a student can um, engage or interact like i'm going to tell them that in the direction so that they're not like trying to for an assignment for example upload you know a, a doc, doc and i've limited it to a pdf only right i'm going to put that in my direction so that my students aren't aren't caught off guard um so clear directions guidelines i always linked out to help guides i don't know um i don't know how you guys feel about that but i wanted my students to to go there first to ask questions um uh, with their colleagues, right, and to look at the guides and then come to me if they couldn't figure it out. So I always linked them out to help guides. Um, and I loved rubrics. I'm a big fan of rubrics. Um, I think that they definitely help if we're going to talk more about those guidelines, right, and clear expectations. I think rubrics really help um, clear those up. Uh, they make it very clear and transparent what you needed, what you need to do to to be successful in this particular um, assignment or discussion. I also like the idea of offering um, choice right when you can um so giving students choices in their assignments what they can complete and then uh, choice of mode which i also think is is awesome right and being responsive to um, different styles of learning and different learning needs we can do that, that same kind of thing in assignments right um so how we interact with our our knowledge clear expectations um i always nest my assignments and modules. Um, I didn't used to say that when I was talking to teachers, but then I found out that that a lot of teachers weren't doing that. And so I wanted to um, pass that along to you, right? My students, and I'm going to talk about navigation in just a second, um, interacted with the module here. And that was it, right? When they were in my course, they were not clicking around, right? They went to the modules and then they went to the homepage and grades and maybe announcements, right? And that was it. I think that was all I had um, for course navigation. I, I think nesting your assignments and modules um, helps with that navigation and clear expectations for students. And 
reduces the risk that they're not going to click in the right spot, right? That they're not going to know what's expected of them. If you're going to have an external tool, um, <laughs> I always provided it an explanation of how to interact with that, always, um, because that is not what I'm assessing. I'm not assessing their ability to interact with XYZ tool, right? I'm, I'm uh, looking at the content knowledge, right? So I always made sure that that was um, as mitigated as possible. Um, and then I also like this, right? That I can, and we, we just said this with um, discussions, but that I could accept a variety of submission types. So um, we tend to kind of create assignments and discussions kind of in the same way and with the same submission types, but I encourage you, um, if nothing else, then to try um, opening up that world just a little bit to give their students voice and choice and how they show you what they know. Um, all right, and the last thing, so these are our um, quick, quick things, but the last thing is course navigation. Um, I mentioned this, right, that I, I locked down my navigation, right? So this is what my students had access to. Um, they could not come into my course navigation um, and go directly to um, assignments or assessments or right like that. I wanted them to go through the content the way I wanted them to go through the content. And I didn't want them to go straight to the quizzes, take the quizzes and and maybe do all right. Um, maybe not considering they skipped all the content. And so I was real particular right about how how they engaged with the content in my course. And they did that in modules um, in the order that I wanted them to do. So I would encourage you if you haven't gone in um, into your course settings, right, into navigation, and kind of, it's real easy, you just drag the items from the top to the bottom, anything that you don't want to show, um, make sure you hit save, and then um, it'll happen automatically, right? And the question I get all the time, so if you're thinking it, um, don't feel silly, I, I thought it too at one point, that if I don't have um, assignments visible, that my students won't be able to see assignments. No, they can see your modules where you have your assignments nested, they can't go to your assignments folder or bucket, right? Like they can't bypass all the content and go straight to things that are graded, um, either on purpose or unintentionally, right? Like I had some sweet babies who who were like, I know I have assignments to do and they went to assignments and they did very poorly and they couldn't figure out why they didn't know the information, right? They didn't, they didn't understand the navigation and like how to navigate that space. And so other kids are super savvy and they know they can bypass it, right? So, you know, could be, could be intentional, could be unintentional, but just wanted to point that out because um, we were talking about navigation, right? Being a um, component of accessibility. So these are, um, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, these are just some quick things I wanted to make sure you know about. Um, the first one is Canvas Commons. If you aren't familiar or aren't aware of Commons, um, check it out. It is, um, you can filter, you can find, it used to be that you, you could only share courses, right? It's, it's kind of like a um, a cloud space, a cloud storage space or a Dropbox or something along those lines, right? Um, you can now uh, pull down modules, quizzes, assignments, or yeah, um, very specific pieces and components of Canvas courses, home, just a homepage, right? Like if you wanted to search for a cool home, homepage, you could, then you can bring that into your um, sandbox if you wanted to or into your course. And, and utilize it there. So, and it's free. Um, it's not uh, vetted. None of the resources are vetted by by us. We just kind of put the space there and then encourage teachers to share and collaborate. Um, and you can share yourself and you can share to your district, to yourself, use it. I always uh, backed my courses up there because it's free, it's free cloud storage. So I would send my courses there for the summer um, and then pull them back down, right? Uh, the other thing I wanted to make sure you guys were aware of is direct share, um, because it is amazing uh, that you can send to um, other colleagues that you um, uh, engage with or work with. And if you're the teacher of record in both courses, you can copy too. And we probably, I think, are going to do another session on SpeedGrader. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I at least put this up and shared it with you, just some tips and tricks on um, SpeedGrader. I think that Canvas has a lot of areas that it can improve on and uh, feedback is something that we do really well. So um, if you're not utilizing uh, SpeedGrader to create, to give students um, feedback, to create a feedback loop in particular, um, I, would, I would highly encourage you to do that because it is something that, um, that we, that's robust, that we do really, really well on the Canvas side of things. 
And the last thing, so these are um, just some quick tips and tricks that you can play around with once you have the, um, the slide deck right. Um, I always mention auto open inline files. So if you embed a PDF, you can have it um, auto open so that when students navigate to that page, it's already um, open for you. Um, if you don't know how to do that, there's a link there. Um, undelete, if you've never heard of undelete, um, prepare to be amazed. Um, that happens. You can try control Z, but like, well, if you're on a, um, a Mac, is it the same in, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not a Mac. Is it control Z? Do you know? Uh, well, it's control Z on a PC. It's command on a PC. Z. On command Z. That's right. The one on the other side. Sorry. Command Z on a Mac. Um, and then uh, duplicating course content. Um, definitely check out a link with some more information on that. Is there anything else? Uh, and I think that's it. I just brought those other things back around. Um, I think that's it, guys. I've been working since seven o'clock this morning. So my brain is a little, <laughs> it's a little fuzzy. <laughs> things are very busy in Kansas land right now. Um, I appreciate your patience and your and your um, willingness to listen to me. Um, talk about these things. I can stay for just like a couple more minutes. If anybody has any questions, I can help answer. Though you will be an excellent yeah, answer, say, Corey. Let's uh, let's open up. If you guys have any questions, you can feel free to type it in the chat, uh, or I can. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, I'm happy to unmute you and and answer your questions. You're welcome, Jennifer. We'll say before I forget. Computers act a little slow now. I go ahead and drop Sarah's slide deck in the chat, maybe. I'm going to put that there. I am also going to, uh, those of you guys that hung out with us, thank you for doing so. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I am going to send you guys a um, link to this in an email as well as your um, PDF CEU certificate for you guys.